welcome to JC Live, your weekly source for JCL news and fun. I'm your host, Mr. Kurt Ristroff, Publications Chair for the National Junior Classical League, an organization of middle and high school students in classical courses. With me today is Magistra Natalie Roy from Louisiana, who is the Louisiana, uh, let's see, 2020 Teacher of the Year, overall Teacher of the Year, according to this thing that I've got pulled up on the side. No, 2021 Overall Teacher of the Year. Oh, it's probably for this school year. Got it. Um, Magistra Roy uh, has won more accolades than I have time to list, and we're going to talk with her in just a couple of minutes about uh, her really fantastic courses, uh, one in particular that she's designed and started teaching on Roman technology. Uh, that's going to be the subject of tonight's show. You might have noticed that today's show is a little bit different from normal in that it's not exactly live. We're premiering on YouTube instead of going live on YouTube, and that's because I'm on vacation for the next two weeks, so we'll still have shows. There's still a show today, and there's still a show on Monday, and there's still a live chat for everybody to hang out and talk to each other and have a good time. The only difference is what you say in the live chat won't uh, affect exactly what Magistra Roy and I are going to talk about because we, um, we can't see it because it's in the future for us now, but it's in the present for you as you're watching this, so you get it. Um, so we're going to have the same show as normal. We'll start with announcements and updates, and then uh, Magistra Roy and I will talk for uh, a good long while about what it is that she does and who she is and all that. Um, we will not end with um, officer announcements because the officers um, won't have had anything to announce until today when you're watching this show. Uh, so Rais and Lindy uh, are in the chat, and they can let you know what they are uh, up to this week. So we'll start out with announcements. Let's see. Here we go. And we've got just a couple of announcements. Because I'm trying to predict what the announcements are going to be in a couple of weeks, whenever this goes live, it's a little bit harder. So um, number one, we're in December now. So the December Club of the Month theme is Dining December. And we're encouraging you to do club activities like selling hot chocolate or uh, hosting a virtual or in-person club dinner or donating canned foods to a homeless shelter or a food bank and you know do, do so in such a way that uh, is safe and all that. So consider following the December Club of the Month theme and you know submit at the end of the month what your club has been up to and you could win. Other things, the Torch US, yes. So at the time of this recording, the winter issue of the Torch US is under construction. But at the time of the, your viewing, it will be out. It will have been out for about two weeks. The link for it will be it is in the description below. Uh, it's a fantastic issue. I just looked over it this evening. A really beautiful work from NJCL editor Irene Calderon from Ohio. Uh, check it out and don't forget to subscribe to the Torch US using a different link in the description below so that you can make sure that it's emailed to you every time a new issue comes out. Uh, joining JCL, the deadline is passed for clubs to register without a chapter fee, so you've got to pay the chapter fee now, but still be sure to register. Encourage your teacher uh, to send in that paperwork and make sure everybody's registered. And every month um, we'll be doing a drawing for folks to win snazzy prizes like water bottles and merchant uh, stickers and pens and things like that with the JCL logo on them, so go ahead and do that. Last thing, um, this isn't exactly a stream, it's a recording, so the same rules for the chat apply. Please don't spam, but it's okay because even if you do, I won't be able to see it because I'm on vacation. Uh, do encourage your friends to sign up, uh, I'm sorry, to subscribe to the show. Don't forget to like uh, and subscribe. Maybe leave a comment if you've got a question for us, all that. Upcoming shows. Next week will be our second pre-recorded show. It'll be an interview with Irene Calderon, who's the NJCL editor. Uh, we've interviewed all the other officers, and then uh, we missed Irene because I got sick, so now we're back, and uh, we'll be talking with her next week. And then in two weeks, we'll be bringing on Florida JCL, their president and vice president for a state spotlight. So uh, be sure to tune back in then, and we'll see you then. Okay, so now, moving things over, please welcome to the show again Magistra Natalie Roy from Baton Rouge, Louisiana at Glasgow Middle School. How are you doing, Magistra? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I muted the tab. Go ahead, how are you doing? I am doing great. Glad to hear it. 
Thank you for coming on. Uh, thank you for being here. It's uh, it's great to have you. We we've known each other for quite a while now. Um, when when I was in um, in undergrad at Louisiana State University, uh, Megistra Roy would send me students to uh, to work with, and um, and that was years ago. <laughs> It was, and those students loved you. Ah, uh, well. You had a special bond with those students that I would send you, which is why I would always try to send you students, because you were so kind and helpful to them. They really, really did trust you, and it was wonderful. Oh, it is. I really enjoyed doing the, the Latin mentoring and Latin tutoring and everything, and I appreciate the opportunity. So uh, since that time, Magistra Roy has designed and started um, this this course on Roman technology that we're going to talk about. Um, you also teach a bunch of other things. Can you tell us about all the classes you teach at Glasgow? Of course. I am um, a Latin teacher, of course. And since I'm at a middle school, I teach a different Latin course for each um, grade level. But I also teach some interesting electives. Uh, the first one that everyone has been talking about so much is Roman technology. And in this class, we recreate the products and processes of ancient Roman daily life through experimental archaeology. So we try to build things as the Romans would have done. We try to experience things as the Romans would have. Um, building on the success of that course, which everyone at my school seems to want to take uh, lately, uh, I created another course called Myth Makers. And in this class, we sort of take the idea of STEM and STEAM and bring it into the, the ancient world. So we use ancient stories like uh, the story of Arachne, for instance. And from that story, after we've studied it and learned from it, we, we do a creative project um, based on it. So for example, we might um, you know, learn to weave. Uh, when we study, you know, Odysseus and his great voyage, we uh, do a, a whole project on designing cardboard boats that actually float. So um, that's the idea behind that class. And that has also been a lot of fun. Um, this year, for the first time, I am not teaching the Myth Makers class because I uh, decided to focus kind of on the Roman tech class during the pandemic times. Mm -hmm. um, because it's a STEM class, um, I have to, I, I, I do want to be as inclusive as I can with all of my students. And currently I have half, about half of my students at home and half of my students in front of me in my classroom. So to make sure that everyone is kind of learning on the same level, we are doing kits that get picked up by each student's family. Okay. And we, um, we use those to help us, you know, with the hands-on projects that we do. So yeah, it's been a challenge. So I'm focusing on that challenge this year. And next year I'll go back to teaching the Myth Makers class, hopefully as well. Gotcha. So this, that's a unique, strategy for keeping you originally said that the class was experimental experiential learning with yes. and and so you found a way to keep it that way without fundamentally changing yes. the class with these kits uh that's exactly cool. yeah um i could not see doing uh, a stem class without it being hands-on i just I, I can't imagine that and um i think that especially in this time you know when students are at home um, they need to be engaged in different ways, you know, not just watching things, but actually doing things and designing things and making things. Gotcha. So I've got a bunch of questions about this class. The, and the first one was, <coughs> excuse me, you said it's an elective. When I was in middle school, I didn't get to take electives. How does that work? Yeah. Well, at, with our schedule at Glasgow, and I think this schedule is pretty common in schools, public schools in East Baton Rouge Parish mm -hmm. and a lot of others in the state, it's an A-B day schedule. Okay. So on any day that's designated an A day, there are four classes and uh, those classes are an hour and a half long. And that just kind of, you know, works out for that day. And then the next day, which is designated a B day, you have four different classes, mm. same amount of time for each class, just different classes. So in other words, this gives you eight classes to take. So you can probably do the math. Um, four of those classes are gonna be your core four classes. One is gonna be for PE, 
which takes you to five. And now you've got three sections for electives. And many students will take, um, especially in our gifted and talented program, will take a second language like Latin, like French, like Spanish. But then you're left with these two classes that you can take anything you want to. And um, at my school, uh, Roman technology seems to be very popular. I have 60 students right now enrolled in Roman technology. So that is three separate sections of Roman tech. Wow. Yeah. On top of Latin and mythology. Yes. On top of the Latin classes, my Latin classes remain rather small. I'm not exactly sure why that is, hmm. but I do know that my Roman technology classes, I have made them to be very inclusive. Anyone can take them. There is a gifted and talented program at my school, but there is also a traditional program and a great scholars program. So I have a mix of all of those programs in my Roman tech classes. Gotcha. And just to be clear, Kurt, there is no Latin requirement for this class. So anyone can take Roman tech. You do not have to be a Latin student. And in fact, and this kind of gets to something that I think is really good about the class, mm -hmm. um, anyone can take it. I have lots of French students. I have lots of Spanish students in my classes. I have lots of students who don't take a second language because their ELA or math scores are not high enough to put them in a position where they can do that. They have to take a double English language course. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they can take an elective like this um, allows them to, you know, meet students from all over Baton Rouge uh, all abilities, all levels, and we're all together in one, you know, really interesting hands-on class. That's about awesome. the and, and they're yeah. still getting, yeah, the, the classical content. I mean, that's something that I feel yeah. very strongly about. Exactly. The... You know, I, I like to say that is are, are Latin students the only ones that deserve to get to study the ancient classical world? No. I ask, you know, no, right? Yeah. So, but I think that in many ways that those are the students that are, are getting that, you know, that knowledge because of that. So I, I really wanted to expand um, the classical world and open it up to kids that might never get to study it. In I think Louisiana, and I'm pretty sure this is across the board, sixth grade is usually um, the curriculum for social studies where they get a unit on the Romans and Greeks. Okay. But beyond that, I'm not sure. And um, so I, I think it's a great it's a great uh, age to study the Romans and Greeks. And the idea of bringing STEM into this is something that I think needed to be done a long time ago. Uh, it is a very nice, easy mix um, because there's so much that the Romans and Greeks did uh, that is that you know has influenced stem concepts of today yeah absolutely i mean this is something we we like to say at least when i was in high school and we were trying to recruit people to take latin over spanish or french we would say well look in latin class you get you get all the history you get all the mythology you get all the culture you get everything uh and the language and the literature and all of this um and that is cool and that is a, a great thing about how latin has traditionally been taught but then if you want to learn something you know, if you want to learn those things, you have to take Latin. And so if people don't want to take Latin, but they still want that knowledge of, of ancient Greece and Rome, this now is a model that people can use. Um, and I, I love the, the STEM approach to it. Yeah. And, you know, Kurt, I think a lot of um, teachers, a lot of Latin teachers will tell you they simply do not have the time in their curriculum to include many of the mythological stories, hmm. many of the, you know, uh, cultural things that they would want to. If you are on an AP track curriculum, which, you know, many Latin teachers are, not all, but many are, um, it is really very quick. You've got to, you know, start in eighth grade, you've only got three years to prepare. And then, you know, in 11th grade, you, you are thrown into the fire of advanced placement Latin. Hmm. and there's just not a lot of time for the cool, fun, you know, hands-on projects that those teachers might want to do. Yeah. I mean, I've known a lot of students who they got through AP in 11th grade and then in 12th grade, because they had made it through, well, then you get to take 
Greek or you get to take something like that. But that's a five year path. You know, that's that's yeah. a big commitment <laughs> to get to those things. So, yeah, um, exactly. So can you tell me a little bit about your background and how it is that you came to the STEM approach to to this? Sure. Um, well, I um, studied Latin and um, Greek. Uh, I, I started, I think, at LSU, I was, uh, my major, I had a double major in English and English literature and Latin. And then, of course, knowing that I wanted to pursue a career in classics, I went on to get a, a master's degree in um, ancient Greek and Latin. And um, some, you know, uh, someday I'll hopefully get a PhD, but you know, it's a regret. I'm, I'm here to tell you, if you are, love classics, if you love Latin, go all the way because you never know when, you know, you might end up teaching it and wishing that you had studied something more deeply. Um, but then after uh, I got my master's degree, I, I went quickly into teaching and have never left it. It was definitely the right career for me. I love teaching. I love my students. Um, I love the field. About three, four years ago, I um, was at a school that had a very strong STEM component, mm -hmm. and they actually had hired someone called an instigator, a STEM instigator. And this person's job was to assist teachers and support any teachers who wanted to add STEM into their curriculum. And so I started thinking to myself, hmm, you know, every time I walk by a STEM classroom, they're doing something, they're having fun, they are learning on a, to me, it just seems more deeply. And so I thought to myself, hmm, how can I put STEM into Latin? And uh, I st spoke to the instigator and I said, you know, wh what do you think about this? And she said, oh my goodness, yes, you know, I'll help you do whatever you want to do. So I put in a proposal to do an upper level um, Latin class based on Vitruvius, uh, who was an ancient Roman architect and engineer and actually scorpion operator as well in the Roman army. And um, I kind of looked at his works. I kind of looked at the work of Dr. Stephen Ressler, who teaches a, uh, um, one of the great courses online uh, about that exact topic, Roman and Greek um, technology. And I started to come up with some thoughts and ideas about things that I thought we could do in a class. And so I proposed it, it got accepted. And I had five students, they were all seniors that year, and they did not want to take advanced placement Latin. Hmm. They just didn't want that, um, that pressure in their last year of school. And so they, uh, we, we did Roman technology, that is what we did that whole year. And then when I left that school, um, I adapted the course because I was at a middle school, you know, I adapted it for younger students and it became, it kind of just blew up into, you know, because we don't have the, the Latin component to focus on, we still, you know, read texts, we read them in translation, but because we don't have that extra added, you know, time that we have to spend on figuring out the Latin and breaking it apart, we now have, we can now do more projects. We can now do so much more. So that's kind of how I came to it. And as I said, it um, I started with Vitruvius. I really looked deeply and I think I spent the summer before I taught the class just reading his complete works, his whole De Architectura. And it's a 10 book work. And uh, I read it actually with another Latin teacher. She and I would meet every week and discuss one book that we had read. and. I kind of looked at it from the perspective of what kind of projects could I, I base on this particular work. Mm -hmm. She looked at it from the perspective of she had a student who was very interested in engineering like you and wanted to read the Latin more specifically and just kind of work on translating Latin and, you know, technical Latin. Yeah. Such so find in a work like that. So she approached it from a different perspective. but. That was so, so helpful because it led to so many other things and uh, other works, you know, um, Plenty the Elder. Um, who else did we do? Plenty the Elder. We did um, the guy who wrote about uh, Roman pipes and aqueducts. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
Um, just so many other things it led to, and it's just been um, a wild ride. I mean, <laughs> there's so, so much. And stuff that you wouldn't even expect there to be STEM in. For example, uh, hairstyling. Oh. Yeah, and just all kinds of areas of daily life. Oh, that... they, they had some material science or something in that with uh, this is how you exactly. saponify soap to make surfactants to clean yourself. To Exactly. There's so much STEM in everyday life that you don't even realize. And, you know, to turn that in, to look back at the Romans, it's even more interesting because they were so much more, you know, I, I think modern people are so removed from material, you know, um, science sometimes that we forget like how how did the romans write you know and what did they use simple things like that you know what did the romans use to grind up grain yeah. you know when's the last time you ground grain for your bread so um even simple things like that make great projects for my students um yeah, that's... and give them great perspective that is awesome. Um, what mm -hmm. what I've never read the Vitruvius. What is the technical Latin like? It's, uh, it's very uh, vocabulary specific. Okay. You know, and I would say even some each book has its own specific vocabulary based on whatever the the theme of that particular chapter. When I say book, I'm talking about a chapter, of course, mm -hmm. might be. You know, the chapter. I think it's it's chapter ten, book ten. That's all about scorpions. Um, mm. the, the Roman catapult. And, you know, there's a vocabulary very specific to that. Gotcha. I mean, yeah, very technical, very difficult. That's a, a regret of mine is that I missed, there was a course offered um, when I was in undergrad that was medieval Latin. And oh, yeah. I know they did Newton in that class. And I've never read Newton's mm -hmm. Latin, but I want to because that, again, very technical, right? Oh, uh, yeah. So that... That is an area I think of Latin that a lot of people don't get in the typical high school curriculum is some of this technical stuff, but that's, that's fun. Yes. And I would agree. And I, I think it's, um, it's difficult, you know, because if you're not a scientist, <clears throat> if you're not an engineer, a lot of it will just simply not make sense. And you do you have know? some of that background I'm reading. I had pulled up a, a bio of you that's on my other monitor here from the uh, the 2021 overall Teacher of the Year Award. Uh, yes. I, I can't emphasize this enough. You know, I could be reading uh, Natalie's bio and accolades, but that would take up the whole 45-minute show. Uh, no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> and it says here that you um, you had spent time, you won a Fulbright and were in, uh, in Rome for a while, at least, uh, doing classical archaeology. Yes, I studied... Um, uh, archaeology with the American um, Academy in Rome, uh, a summer program for Latin students and teachers. So, you know, there is there, there, if you want, you're a student and want to learn more about, you know, the material history of Rome, archaeology, uh, definitely look into that program. Uh, it was eight weeks in Italy, all over different archaeological sites, learning about, um, you know, everything about that stuff. I, I had already done the comparable program in Athens at the American school there. And again, I can't stress that enough. You know, the Romans and very much looked up to the Greeks, as we all know, and important to understand that culture as well. So yeah, those were wonderful like summer experiences as for me as a young teacher and definitely, um, you know, helped me to understand better those cultures and lend that to my students in classes. That's awesome. So somebody pointed out to me one time, uh, an architect pointed out, oh, the Romans didn't have a distinction between architects and engineers like we do today, that mm -hmm. you really had these multi-talented people who were doing like you know you were describing anything from the military technology to building mm -hmm. buildings to building roads um yeah. and you know we often 
in the lectures on Roman military or on Roman technology that I've been at, which haven't been yours, um, they start and say, you know, a lot of this was driven by military innovation. And certainly, you know, a lot of the, the road development was, but I like that you mentioned things like personal care and grooming and, and things like mm-hmm. that, that are, are yeah. fundamentally scientific innovations that are uh, mm-hmm. not necessarily related necessarily to how are we going to build the best bridge so that we can kill the most Gauls. You know? Right. <laughs> yes. Although, you know, if, and I, I mentioned this because, um, I know you are um, an engineer and a mathematician and whatnot. Math is a big part of your life, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Ressler actually has a, um, a lesson about catapults that talks about how catapults actually drove mathematics forward. Um, the square root and all this interesting stuff about how, you know, if it hadn't been for the desire to shoot a better catapult. Mathematics would not be where it is today. So that's fascinating to me. Um, Just a a thought out there. I just think, you know, people a lot of times don't realize how deeply connected um, STEM, what we call STEM today, which has just blown up in the past 20 years in American education, has to do with, you know, the Romans and Greeks. There's so much there. And I think that um, I think classics today could really, you know, use that that wave of, of excitement and education to join itself to. Um, yeah. it, I've also garnered a lot of um, of grant money for my projects. Mm-hmm. I don't. I'm never paid for anything in in my projects. We're always able to get grant money because um, there are so many opportunities for that with when you're teaching a STEM class. They, you know, these companies are are really trying to foster STEM in our schools, especially at the middle school level and elementary. So what are some of the kinds of projects that your students end up doing? Well, one of the big ones that we got a grant for from from Lowe's was to do a sundial. We, we, we made an analematic sundial and the the idea of an analemma which maybe people don't know that term but an analemma is like a kind of an infinity symbol is the the shape of it but it actually refers and vitruvius wrote a whole chapter about this it actually refers to the sun's position in the sky from the vantage point of earth and that's what this type of sundial is based on so the, on this type of sundial, the person who is viewing the time on the dial, their shadow is the indicator on the dial. Oh, and this, mm-hmm, so this all, this all depends on where the sun is in the sky at that particular day of the year. So there was so much in this project, which was awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, we started out by reading Vitruvius's description of the analemma. And um, then we started bringing in the astronomy, you know, how is it that that worked and why does this type of sundial work? Then we had to use some very basic um, principles of orienting the sundials that we we practiced first before we built the actual one. We were out in the parking lot at my school. And um, of course in STEM classes, it's kind of a, a collaboration is very important working together in groups. So I yeah. had my students all in their little groups and we were making our sundials with, we used painter's tape on, on the, uh, on the concrete in the parking lot. And we had to orient to North mm-hmm. and then basically figuring out where the, the, the hourly marks are on the sundial is all um, X, Y coordinates. Okay. So I remember my principal coming out to see this and, you know, elective teachers at my school, part of our job is to support the core curriculum. Okay. Mm-hmm. So she comes out, she's like, oh my God, they're doing X, Y coordinates. You know, this is perfect for the, the leap test coming up. <laughs> so that was, you know, that was perfect. So that was our mathematic, you know, mathematics section of the project. Mm-hmm. 
And then um, we um, took it to the next level by deciding we were going to do this as a mosaic sundial. So each student got to work on um, part of the, the sundial, made their own mosaic. And the really cool thing about it was they got to learn to cut stone the ancient Roman way. Oh, and that, wow. Yeah, that was part of what the grant paid for. So we were able to purchase real mosaic cutting hammers and hardies. Hardy is like the wedge that you put the stone on as you're hammering. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the stone, we got marble, beautiful black um, and white and green marble. And they got to design and um, and then, you know, installing all of that stuff. So that was the technology piece of it. Mm -hmm. And um, then, of course, just getting everything into place and figuring out, okay, we've got these giant, you know, blocks of stone. How are we going to move it? Where are we going to put it? And, you know, all that was our engineering piece. So I kind of put all the, you know, the stem together. And then, of course, the artistic aspect of it, what colors of marble are going to look good together, you know, um, and just the arrangement of the letters and it was ended up being a really, really cool project. It, it took us a long time, you know, um, and then we had to grout everything. And wow. so, yeah, it was um, a huge, really cool project that we got to do. And that was um, a couple of years ago. So our sundial still stands now and you can still tell the time on it. Works great. Okay. So, yeah. So, so each class is doing different projects. You're not doing that that same one no no okay. yeah every year is different it awesome. kind of depends yeah where the kids want to go what's interesting to them for example last year we decided we would do a project on um thermal energy okay so we got to which also kind of picked up with food um mm -hmm. and so we got to bake our own bread roman bread in um, our own little ovens that we made. And then we took it to the next, we always take it to the next level. You know, we built our own little brick kilns and learned about how ovens, bread, ancient Roman bread ovens and kilns worked in ancient times and why bread was so important in the Roman world and how it was made, how it was baked. But then we also uh, looked at votive objects. Um, clay votive objects. Mm -hmm. For example, um, you know, the Romans used um, clay body parts to put in the temple of Asclepius to, you know, hopefully get well. And so the students learned how to um, mold, you know, clay in the form of body parts. And before you ask, because I know someone is wondering out there, yes, we did have a behind <laughs> because, of course, it's middle school. As one does. We yes. had lots of eyes and arms and ears, too, and lips. Mm -hmm. But we did have one booty, yes. <laughs> and so those went into the kilns that we made. Mm -hmm. And we had one day during the weekend where we all came out. Parents came to help. I had teachers helping us, too. And we fired the kilns. Wow. So that was, um, that was a really cool project, too. They're wood, wood fired? Yes, wood fired, just like the Romans. Awesome. Yep. Yeah. So that, again, that was one of our big projects. And this year is my third year uh, at Glasgow. So who knows if we'll even really be able to do a big collaborative project because right now, of course, you know, COVID is making uh, group work very difficult. Yeah. Well, I know when I was in middle school, I would have wanted to build a catapult for sure. And I mm -hmm. loved that you know, Louisiana JCL has a catapult competition at our state convention. And that got guys in my Latin club who didn't show up for anything else, didn't turn out for spirit or certainly any of the art competitions, creative or graphic or anything like that. They wanted to build a catapult man and they were going to build the best darn catapult. And they, they did. So I don't know. I mean, one of our catapults <laughs> shot backwards really far so we turned it around and and won but you know i don't know if that's that may be too i mean we're dealing with like heavy plates and things you know as counterweights so i don't know if that would be that would work out well actually we just kurt we just finished our catapult project in my what? class 
Uh, we did not discuss this before the show. We did, this was not I planned. Could, I know. I can tell you all about it. Um, we we do actually a whole unit in my class on warfare because there is so much, you know, um, there's so much good stuff in, in warfare with the mm -hmm. Romans. But uh, one of the things that um, I always say to myself and to my students, because they always ask is, we cannot make things that are actual weapons, mm -hmm. right? Because we're at a school, okay? <laughs> in, in EBR, we just, we can't do it. And, right. you know, I have seen amazing models of, you know, Vitruvius' Scorpion, for instance, that is very carefully explained in, in his book. And could we make this? Probably. I mean, you know, I could probably get a grant to get uh, woodworking tools and make it happen. But um, it would be dangerous. I mean, you know, it's a real scorpion. Yeah. So my, my fix for this is we always build miniature models. Okay. And um, this year we did it a little bit different because, of course, I've got students who have to work at home because of COVID and those that are with me. So each uh, student got a catapult building kit and we built actually three different catapult models uh, in our kit. And just to give you an idea, Kurt, these are all like a uh, little popsicle stick style uh, catapults that shoot ping pong balls, um, Play-Doh, you know, cotton balls, things like that. And, um, so that's what we did. And then we, we built the three different models and then the students you always have to take it to the next level. Right. Yep. So we had a design competition after that. My students really enjoy competitions and they used what they had learned in building the three models. And they kind of, you know, came up with a design that they thought would work. And that design was then built and then used in uh, three challenges. And the challenges were to sh see how far you could shoot your catapult, mm -hmm. to see if it could knock down a tower of paper cups, and to see um, how, if you could get it in, how accurate it was, if you could get your projectile into a bowl, for instance. Awesome. So yeah, that we just finished that that uh, that challenge just right before this. So yeah, that was very good. Exciting. And and then if they're used to working with miniatures and that introduces, I mean, that opens up opportunities for you to do bridges or, you know, mm -hmm. a set of baths Absolutely. or something for heat transfer, yeah. like something large, but they can, if they're used to working in miniature. Right. And that has been a struggle, you know, um, how much would I love to build an actual Roman road, mm -hmm. which I've actually been asked to do by my principal for this one particular soggy area at the school, but you know, maybe at a, later time when COVID is not an issue and we can work more collaboratively. But yes, models are a great way to um, to take, you know, some of those bigger projects and scale them down and still get the concepts and the principles, but without the big the big scale. Yeah. Now, how in depth, like when you'll talk about roads or Roman concrete or something, how how far can you go into the, the real meat of the material science with these students. I mean, like crystal forms mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. crack propagation and these kinds of things. Um, well, we've done concrete in my class. We actually do concrete. Uh, and as far as like the crystalline structures and stuff, again, I'm supporting the core curriculum. So mm -hmm. I will have my students read articles about why ancient Roman concrete is particularly effective and why it can set underwater and those kinds of things. Now, do we look at the actual chemical, you know, principles and everything? Not that specific. That's a little bit beyond their understanding at that level. Mm -hmm. But we do read, you know, I push them to read these articles that are written for adults, basically, you know, in science magazines and Atlas Obscura and things like that. So yes, we definitely do that. Uh, we do talk about, um, for concrete, we, we talk about um, where the materials come from. Hmm. We talk about how the materials change, how the chemical reaction occurs from, you know, heating limestone in a kiln. I actually have a teacher um, at another school who, who fires the limestone for me to get it to where we can use it for concrete. But yeah, we do actually mix the concrete and we talk about the reaction that gives off heat. So it's, you know, 
hypothermic, you know, reaction and all that stuff. And uh, we actually, we set the concrete in little forms that we build and then we test its tensile strength. Oh so, man, really? Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. How do you, how do you, yeah. how do you test it? We have, we actually, well, I, you know, I always, I'm very frugal because grant, you never know when grant money is going to run out or whatnot. You have to manage your, your collection of materials very carefully. Mm -hmm. A very wise science teacher um, told me that I could use, instead of buying a set of weights, which I would probably have to buy for each set of students, she said, just get you a um, two milliliter a two um, liter bottle mm. and show them how, you know, liters work with weight, which is a great review of the metric system yep. and use the, use that fill up a Coke bottle with water and incrementally increase it and hang it. We, we set the concrete on like um, two desks. So the concrete is in bars or strips. And mm -hmm. I can show you pictures if you want to see. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. We, just, we hang, we hang the, the, the weight on the concrete bar. Cool. So if I'm remembering yeah. my, my, if I'm remembering those articles that I've read from Atlas Obscura and, and Science Magazine, <laughs> Roman concrete, um, the, the major difference between modern concrete and Roman concrete, other than a little bit of the materials makeup, is that these days we put rebar in all of our concrete and that mm -hmm. improves their tensile strength. So if you take a piece of modern concrete without rebar in it and a piece of Roman concrete, the, the Roman mm -hmm. concrete would be superior, but it is only the addition of this steel uh, rebar that is that's making a difference because the Romans didn't use concrete for their its tensile strength. They used it for its compressive strength. Is, is, that, is right. that right? For the most part. Now they did put things in their concrete to reinforce it, mm -hmm. such as um, shells, mm -hmm. believe it or not, clam shells, even these things are found in the concrete structures. I mean, you can look at the Pantheon for instance. Oh, it's got the they pots. Found, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's it's all in there, and they had a way of you know getting lighter material as they went up. So yeah, but there's also of course the um, the uh, mud, the volcanic mud, mm -hmm. the volcanic you know dust. And I don't know if you've ever actually worked with uh, volcanic dust from Vesuvius. It it really is an amazing thing. And we order ours locally. Ours comes from Saint Mount St. Helens. <laughs> oh, okay. Local. Local. Yeah, for those of you in the in the chat who don't know, it's uh it's hard to get rocks in Louisiana. <laughs> and there's there are no volcanoes in Louisiana. Uh -oh. Nope. So. so that's our nearest volcano. Gotcha. Oh so, yeah. Yeah. Can I see some pictures? Absolutely. Let me share my screen with you. Yeah. I have, um, I did a presentation on this class for uh, ACL a couple of summers ago. Mm -hmm. And um, this was the presentation from that. So I'm just going to show you a few pictures. And let's see here. One of the big questions I ask my students, I always like to ask my students is how do we know the things that we know about the ancient world? Mm -hmm. We do not have ancient Romans walking around. And, you know, one of the major ways that we know, of course, is through literature. But we all know that literature from the Roman period is biased in many ways, right? Um, rich male people wrote most of the literature that we have. So you really want to look at other sources of information about the ancient world. And of course, one of those is archaeology. Mm -hmm. So this picture is, these pictures are from an archaeology unit that my students do with a state archaeologist who comes in and they learn different methods of, um, you know, a dig. They get to um, map out their, their space and interpret the artifacts that they find. So yeah, that's usually how we start the year. We were not able to do that this year again because of the restrictions, but that's okay. We're making the best of the year. I love one of the units that we do is on household crafts. 
So in this picture, you can see the guys are learning how to we learning how to spin real uh, wool here. Where do you get the wool? Um, uh, someone brought me some. I have all kinds of friends in all the right <laughs> places that I can get these things from. But you can you can pretty much order anything almost in the world on Amazon at this point. So you can actually buy raw wool there too. This is a loom that someone donated to our classroom. So the kids here are, um, they're uh, warping the loom. Wow. This is from our hairstyling unit that we did. So we took this picture here, mm -hmm. this statue, which is another great place to find um, information about the Roman world. And we reproduced this hairstyle on a teacher. And of course, you know, this is the type of stuff that, like you say, you wouldn't expect to find technology in it, but it's there. Mm -hmm. uh, the Romans used uh, these long uh, wooden or metal needles, and they're not sharp. They're not like a sewing needle, but, um, and they would sew the hair. And really? if you look closely at this picture, you'll see the yarn that was used to keep this hair in place. Okay. Um, so you know, some of my my African American students like to think of this. It, it very much resonates with my African American students because um, there is a lot of sewing in African hairstyles, gotcha. and they just thought this was really really neat because it is technology. You know. Wow. And then here we have a little cooking unit we did. Um, so she's grinding up something here with a mortar and pestle. Uh, if you've never used a mortar and pestle, it is a very ancient and very simple technology, but mm -hmm. one that, you know, is, is fun to use and learn about. We also do a, a lesson on um, metalworking, excuse me, leatherworking. And here you see some bulli that mm -hmm. um, my students have created out of uh, leather. And they get to use leatherworking hammers to make the holes in the leather. And they learn to sew. Wow. Do you have students then, who are, I know you do a lot of work with the Girl Scouts. Do you get students who are in Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts who already have some sewing skills or leatherworking or metalworking skills? Yes, absolutely. But, you know, uh, Girl Scouts, just like with anything, it's a very, um, it depends on the girl's leader. You know, um, there are some troops that are very focused on, you know, cookie sales and travel. And likewise, there are some troops that are more focused on camping skills and outdoors, outdoor ship, you know, so it, it just depends. OK, because I, I asked that because I had I probably had tried to make something like that, like the bull eye at a, at a Boy Scout yeah. camp at some point when yeah. I was around that age. So that's cool. To yeah. Yeah. And usually, you know, I always try to take it. To the lowest form, like, you know, um, can the students use some type of technology when they're doing this? I don't want to just go ahead and put the holes in there for them. I want them to see how the holes got there. Yeah. How would the Romans have done it? You know, so, yeah. Consequently, there are holes in the linoleum floors of my classroom. <laughs> <But> <laughs> that's an old building. So as my principal says... Just don't burn anything down, Miss Roy. That's, you know, <laughs> don't burn anything down. This is uh, our concrete unit that we we did. And you can see the students are putting the concrete into the molds here mm -hmm. that we created. We're letting them dry here on the windowsill. And here we are testing them. This is that method I told you about. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 So there you go. This was a, um, a type of biscuit that we made, a biscuit out of some bread that we tried to, you know, grind our own grain for. We didn't end up grinding enough grain to make the entire biscuit, but everyone did get a little bit of hand ground grain in their biscuits. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is a unit on hydraulics, actually. And this is where we learn the basic concepts of the Roman arch. Mm -hmm. It's a little building kit that I use for that, which makes it kind of simple. You get to teach the students that in the real world, building materials <laughs> don't have Lego studs on them that 
That's exactly. Hold and you know, that's together. another thing. A lot of people ask about Legos. We don't use Legos in this class for that mm. very reason. But I do think there's value in Legos. Don't get me wrong. It's just not with this. Um, this is a water screw project that we were working oh, on. Oh, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. And you've colored the water yeah. so it's more visible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you know, this is the thing uh, that I love about this class. The student that you see here, I'm, yeah, and he won't mind me telling you this. Um, he's one of my special, very, very special students. Um, he had a lot of trouble reading and was actually going to drop my class when he first got into it. And I told him, no, you can't do that. You know, you're going to do so well. He ended up getting the award for the class at the end of the year. And he also won this competition. He is someone who has a very innate sense of physical properties of things. Okay. He's got and all he's the really, spatial reasoning. Exactly. And he can, even though he has trouble reading, he can do these types of projects. And he actually won this comp this design competition too. So, um, you know, I think there's great value in this type of class for that reason. Uh, whereas, a, you know, a language-based class would have excluded such a student. So That's a this is our aqueduct modeling uh, project. They get to design their own aqueduct. It has to have uh, certain things in it. So it's got to have a siphon. It's, mm -hmm. you know, all different things that some aqueducts would have had. This is a little project we do on um, Roman bathing. So the students get to bathe their, their arm and use a striggle, which you can see here is this plastic knife, Kurt. Mm -hmm. And so on. And let's see, I'll just pick out a couple more here. This is one of our, our, this is from our warfare unit. They do make a shield. Okay. And that helps us to learn about, you know, Roman um, military tactics, such as the testudo. Mm -hmm. But then they also get to try to dislodge each other from their their square. And you may see that they have, they have uh, foam swords here. Yep. So, yeah, that's about, this is one of our catapults. Oh, okay, yeah. Very simple. Yeah, and this is our sundial uh, orientation here. Yeah. House designing, I think this was. This was uh, designing our, our mosaics for the sundial. We also do a unit on gaming, gaming technology in the ancient world. Oh, I don't know. The first thing about that. What? Yeah. Um, so this is a game called Rota here, which is basically wagon wheel. Mm -hmm. And it's similar to tic-tac-toe, kind of, yeah. But the students build all their own games and learn to play them. This is um, a stone-cutting hammer and hardy yeah. that she's using here. That's and real... this was, oh, yeah. That's a real tool, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, this awesome. was our stone-cutting uh, workshop here, <laughs> as you can see. And uh, here is our one of our finished mosaic pieces here we are putting in some tesserae on the um eventual finished piece which is here wow yeah i don't say it's a real tool like i'm surprised i say that's a real tool because i'm jealous <laughs> and that's yeah oh no that's the yeah, next thing totally. i wanted it you know totally um it's just uh, it's a it's a great uh it's really a wonderful class. I've, I've just really enjoyed teaching it these past few years, and I, I I hope there's never a time where I'm not teaching it. So that that leads me to the next. Um, here, I'm going to switch back to the, the screen with just you and me. Um, yeah. That leads me to the next question, which I think is probably the last mm -hmm. thing we're going to talk about. Is uh, there are probably a bunch of people in the chat who are saying. Oh my God, this is amazing. I never got to do this when I was in middle school. I love this class. I love this idea. Mm -hmm. And what would you recommend for people who want to either, if they're still in school, uh, middle or high school, and they want to take a class like this, or if they're maybe later in high school or some of the SCLers who I know watch this show, maybe you want to end up teaching a class like this. What would you say to, to each of those groups? Well, first of all, I would say... Um, reach out to me because I can certainly give you some some recommendations. 
I know that I'm going, I, I know that this movement is kind of getting started because I was asked to present at, on a panel coming up at the Classical Association of Middle West, the Middle West and South. Mm-hmm. Their annual meeting is coming up in April. And I was asked to be on a panel for a, a discussion about STEM in classics. So that's encouraging to see that there are other people who are interested in the very same thing that I am. Um, there is a lady teaching, um, Dr. Sarah Stroop. She is teaching a class similar to this, although I think there's much more Greek stuff added in. At, I think she's at the University of Washington hmm. in Washington State. So you definitely want to look for that class. And then, of course, you can go and watch the great courses. Yeah. Um, Dr. Stephen Ressler's course called Understanding Greek and Roman Technology. It's fantastic. And you would learn a lot just, you know, watching that. Some of his models are very, very amazing. I mean, he clearly has a workshop and a prof- he is a professional craftsman. I mean, he has made some amazing things. So don't watch that and get discouraged. Mm-hmm. Instead, you want to go and, you know, seek out how some of these things can be done um, on a, you know, a smaller level. Uh, a lower level because they definitely can you know we don't you don't have to build a full-size model of a catapult for you to understand the principles and um you know learn more about it no so yeah the the last thing i wanted to say is is echoing a comment that you had made when we were talking before the show which was um you know we were talking about career options for folks who have um had Mm -hmm either classics or some kind of STEM at training or both. And um, Mm -hmm. I had mentioned that, you know, something that I was thinking about was possibly uh, because I have a background both in classics and in engineering, I was saying, oh, well, you know, maybe I could go to some high school and teach both chemistry and Latin. Uh, And you had mentioned, well, go ahead and and reiterate, if you wouldn't mind, the point that you made earlier about... um, Latin mm-hmm. programs and people not wanting to hire a full on a full time Latin teacher because I a think lot, it's going to be important for our, our audience to hear. Absolutely, a lot of um, schools, y'all, are um, you know small. There's a lot of small private schools out there. There's a lot of big public high schools, y'all, that just can't afford to hire someone um, full time for a Latin program. You know, a lot of times if you're starting a Latin program at a school, it's going to be small. You're not going to have a full time experience with that. So having a second career, um, in a science, a math is most likely going to get you hired to teach, you know, math half your day, Latin, maybe another half of the day, maybe even a course like this with that kind of background. So that I think is, um, important to think about from a career perspective. If you're interested in classics, don't just think of classics as the language. It's not just the language, right? We've got the archaeology of the ancient world. There is so much STEM in archaeology in and of itself. Um, You know, so don't just, I, I hate when people think about the classics as simply studying the languages and not the whole picture. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. I think that's a really yeah. important message, you know. Uh, and obviously, you're you're a lot closer to the state of um, middle and high school education in America, mm-hmm. and, and getting that perspective is super valuable. So, so thank you. Mm-hmm. That's it's right at an hour, so I'm going to say that's our show, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning well, in. Kurt, a huge... Can I just can I just say oh, one more thing? Please, please. Um, Okay, so as you as Kurt said earlier, y'all, I am the Louisiana State Teacher of the Year. My my service year begins in January for 2021. And part of being Teacher of the Year means that you get to work on some kind of passion project or something that, you know, gets others involved in your field. Uh, I have already spoken with Louisiana JCL and we're going to be doing a day of ancient STEM coming up in April, okay? And this will be a virtual experience, but here's the good news. We're going to be creating kits that we mail out to participants so that during the time that, you know, we're 
creating or making, you're going to be able to do it right along with us without having to worry that, oh, I don't have that. Or, oh, I don't know how to do You're going to have all the stuff you need in this kit. And more details will be coming out soon. Um, Everything is kind of just getting started, but you should expect to hear something, hopefully, from Louisiana JCO uh, in early January. And this will be sometime in April. We're, we're thinking, you know, around the time of Rome's birthday, because what better way to celebrate Rome's birthday than with STEM? That's amazing. I hadn't heard about that. If there's anything I can do to help out, please let me know. I'd love to be a part Ooh, of that. Thanks. Yeah. We, well, we might be reaching out. Cool. That's our show, everybody. Uh, thanks so much to Natalie Roy, Magistra Natalie Roy from Glasgow Middle in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, for coming on and talking about all of this really fun, interesting, uh, <laughs> dynamic, interactive work that she's been doing with her students. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. Please don't forget to, uh, to hit the like button. Consider subscribing. Tell your friends all those things. We'll see you next week for another pre-recorded show. And then in two weeks from now with uh, the return of the live version of JC Live. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Cheers.